Hey guys, today we are in the book of 1 John chapter 1. Now, as we get into this week and next week's reading into the letters of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, they're all written to the same group of people with just a little slight um, theme of each letter. But the overarching um, idea of these letters is that John, the Apostle John, is overseeing a bunch of house churches uh, in and around the town of Ephesus. Now, these, these Christians that make up these churches are, are probably Jewish Christians. Um, and he's writing because there's just mainly one issue that has happened. There's been a group of Jewish Christians, um, well, or Jews, who said they were Christians. They have broken off from these churches. And they have proclaimed that Jesus is not the Messiah, so they would not be saved. Um, but not only did they just get mad and leave and not and believe in Jesus, but they're they're kind of being hostile. They're, they're trying to disturb the church. They're trying to break up some of the churches as they leave. And so John writes um, these letters to help kind of keep them together and to remind them that Jesus is still God, uh, that he is with them, and they are still doing the right thing, okay? So let's jump right into uh, 1 John chapter 1, that which was from the beginning, talking about the gospel message, right? We're, we're reassuring Christians that they are saved uh, and that they are living and doing the right thing. So that which was from the beginning, the gospel message, which we have heard, we've seen in our eyes, which we've uh, looked upon, we've touched concerning the words of life, seeing that they've heard Jesus, um, they've touched Jesus, they've smelt Jesus, they, they've used their senses to be around Jesus. So they know that Jesus was real. They know Jesus is true. They know his message is true. And not only that, verse 2, the life, God's life was made manifest and we have seen it. Well, we've seen this word before, manifest. It's the word phaneru uh, in Greek. It just means to make visible. And so God made visible, uh, and that was in the form of Jesus. We have seen it, and we testify it. We bear witness to it. We, we tell our stories of why uh, the meeting of Jesus is true, right? Um, and we proclaim it to you for eternal life, which was from the Father made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaimed also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. Now that word fellowship, uh, of course, is the word koinonia. It means to partner or to share. And so he's saying, hey, we're sharing the gospel because we want you to be a part of our family. We want you to be a part of us. We want to come a lot, to come together in like ideas and become what we call today a church, a spiritual family. Uh, so we're sharing the gospel so that people will have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. Not only we as Christians or do we share the gospel to bring other people in to create a better spiritual earthly family, but as Christians, we must also remember that we share koinonia, partnership, fellowship with the Father, God, and the Son, Jesus Christ. We are partners with him. Uh, we've seen, as we've read through, Paul uses the word adopted. We are adopted as sons and daughters to the king. And so that's why we have that koinonia, that fellowship. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Think about um, Paul writing in Philippians. Our joy is not by circumstance. That's happiness, right? Christian's joy um, is only found in Jesus. And so the more you know Jesus, the more joyous you can be. And so John is writing, starting off this letter, right, with this idea of reminding them that they are saved. They are partners with one another as brothers and sisters. They are partners with, with God and with Jesus. And it is the ultimate way of finding joy because they're not finding joy because they're, they're seeing Christian brothers and sisters, supposedly Christian brothers and sisters leave the church and they are trying to tear the church as they go. And so they're not finding joy. So John's writing and says, remember what your true joy is in. <clears throat> Verse five, in this message, 
talked about John, the apostles, the gospel message. In this message, we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light. That's important. God is light. What does that mean? That, that means a whole lot. I mean, that's several sermons all in itself, but God is light. What, what is light? Light makes all things visible. There's nothing that can be hidden from light. There is no darkness. Uh, it illuminates, right? So God is this thing that is bright, that is perfect, that is illuminating, that brings clarity. So God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Well, what is darkness? It's the opposite of light. It would be sin. It would be a shadows. It would be places in which you cannot see. It would be not being made visible. It would be um, secretive. That's not what God is. And so here, John's saying, remember, you have God who is light and you have sin or Satan, which is darkness. There, there's this back and forth. If we, Christians, if we say we have fellowship with him, if we have Queen and Neo with God, while we walk in darkness. Now that word walk, um, we've seen it all throughout the New Testament. It means conduct. It means daily living. It's not just saying if you've sinned once. We all sin every single day. But if there's a perpetual movement of sin, you know it's sin, but you choose to do it over and over and over again, over following the will of God. So if you say, hey, I follow God and you choose daily to sin, if you choose daily to cheat on your spouse, if you choose daily to look at pornography, if you choose daily uh, to go get drunk, if you choose daily to beat your spouse, if you choose daily, all these sins, right? Every single day, you choose sin over God. If you say you work, if you say that God is in you, but you choose to walk in sin and live in sin, it says we lie and do not practice truth. We are a lie. Our actions speak of our faith, the book of James, right? So if we say Jesus is in us, then our actions should be that of Jesus on the outside. Our actions proves our faith. You say you have faith, show me your actions, right? That's what James was about. But if we walk in light, if we walk in holiness, if we walk in illuminating structure, if we walk like we say that God is in us, Paul uses the word light several times in his Gospels to mean sanctification, which is just a church word of saying being more like God. And so if we say we, we walk in God's standard, in God's way, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. So here he is, John's just writing to the people and saying, here's the deal. The people who's leaving the church and are trying to tell the, tear the church apart, He's saying their actions are speaking louder than their words. If you are living like the world and doing things that are against Christ, then it doesn't matter if you say you're saved or not. Your actions are speaking what your heart truly says that you are. But if somebody is living a life of goodness and godliness, then it doesn't matter what they say when they are saved, right? So it's kind of this idea, actions speak louder than words. And so as people are leaving the church and they're trying to hurt the church, John's reminding them, just, just look around. You're going to know who is team God and who is team themselves, right? It's this idea. Um, let's see, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive. Uh, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Uh, because... All have fallen, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? We, we can't say we don't sin. If we confess our sins, that word confess just means agree with. If we agree with God that we are sinners and that we need his help, he is faithful and he is just to forgive our sins. That's a promise out of Jeremiah chapter 31. And he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. If we say we have not sinned, which means we have never sinned, then we make God a liar because God says that we are full of sin and we choose to sin. Romans 1, Romans 2, Romans 3, um, all throughout all of Gospels, even the words of Jesus, right? We choose the things of this world, not the things of God. 
Um, and so we make God a liar because the word or the Bible is not in us. Once again, why are we reading through the Bible? The more we read it, the more we, more we know it, the more we can do it. So what does all this mean? If you go back to verse 6, you can see kind of three types of people. Verse 6 is people who ignored sin, right? He says, if we say we have fellowship him, but walk in darkness. These are people who are um, ignoring sin. They say they're saved, but they're living in sin. They're just ignoring it. Then verse 8, there's a group of people who are saying, um, we have no sin. We are, we're not sinning right now. We're, we're not sinning. And then you have verse 10. There's a group of people saying, we have never sinned, right? So you can see this idea, this group of people that are causing this dissension and trying to tear the church and leaving the church. There are people who are saying that they're not sinning, they don't sin, and that they have never sinned. Well, if you believe that, then you are truly not saved. And that's what John is trying to make sure they understand before he continues on in the letter of helping these Christians. We have to know that we are sinners and that we are nothing compared to the holiness of God. And it is only through Jesus Christ um, that we can be forgiven in those sins. Hope that makes sense. We'll see you tomorrow in chapter two. God bless.